Are we introducing with real names or? No. Okay. Otto Mueller then. Yeah. There. Okay. There you both are. Okay. And Lord Papa. Is it is it actually streaming? Did you hit go live? I then it's streaming. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Penzik. We are here in Belfiore in our encampment, and we are going to get a honey tasting of honeys from all over the world, some of them with some very interesting history. So I am here with someone who is actually a fan of mine and has taken some of my dance classes here at Penzik. This is Otto Müller. He is a professional beekeeper and apparently fell into the profession accidentally through a very unusual route. <laughs> okay, so we're going to cover from lighter honeys to darker honeys because it's going to blow out your palate if you do it otherwise. So let's start with the best honey of Texas. This is considered to be the best honey of Texas since the 1840s when the ABC and XYZ of beekeeping was published, which they keep it up to date about every uh, four or five years. They republish it every year, even throughout the Civil War. And this is from Central Texas. It is a uh, very floral honey, and it is a small white bush, and just a little bit, and you'll have some nice fruity notes to it. It's a good all-around honey, mm. and it can speak for itself. It is very good. Now, that is considered to be the best honey in Texas up until March. Okay. And in March, something <clears throat> extraordinary happened. Uh, as a hunter and a archer, the Texas bow hunters get together every year at what's called an extreme hunt, where on Friday at noon, all food in camp is burned. Mm -hmm. From that point on, you forage, fish, or hunt for whatever food you're going to eat, and they get serious about it. Someone happened to have spot a beehive up in a owl box that the Conservancy probably put out. And we're in a WMA, which is a wildlife management area. No agriculture. We expected this honey to be just honey. It was just gonna be sugar, and we were getting hungry. We'd already gotten one hog, but there's 80 of us. And <laughs> trying, trying to feed us is a bit of a challenge. So I got up there with my gear, and when you're hungry, you're willing to take more risks than usual. We tore this out. We got about 15 to 20 pounds of honey out of it. And it was not what we were expecting. I'm expecting a bitter winter honey. And this, this is something extraordinary. You should taste some toasted pecans in there. Yeah, I was going to say it has a very, has a very rich. It has some berry in the back. It is very, uh, it's like, oh, what's, what is it like? It's like, it's like homemade caramel. Mm. Like homemade caramel. Not the crap that they sell in stores, but actual proper caramel. Someone described it as pecan pie. I hate pecan pie, so I would never say okay. that. <laughs> and I hate pecan pie because mostly it's just so sweet that all you taste is sweet. But probably if pecan pie were actually made properly, i.e. with a proper homemade caramel base, it would taste like that. So you, you found a hog, you, you, you caught a hog, you mean a wild boar? No, wild I, boar. I shot it. Um, that Either way, you, 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 you managed to capture and kill. They're usually huge. It wasn't enough to feed 80 people? Uh, okay, so rule of thumb, about a third of the body weight is actually meat. So it was about an 80-pound sow, oh, okay. and it winds up being about 25, 27 pounds of meat. And they eat it from snout to hoof, and we ate it all within six hours. Okay, well. And I think we made soup out of the squeal. I mean, it was gone. It was, it was delicious, though. I do love pig's feet braised long so that they just form, fall into a jelly. Mm. The Brazilians we had with us boiled the tongue. And you can, you can get a, about three hours to boil it, and you can get a pretty <clears throat> nice... Uh, they're making a soup out of that. So this next one is a unique one. The Americans do not have sour oranges like the Iranians do. This is Iranian. The Iranians, they're, they're trading honey for ages. You, I have no idea how old this orchard is. Oh my God. Oh my God. That tastes like an orange. Amazing. You can get orange blossom in Florida, but it's sweet orange. Mm. 
Mm. This is sour orange. No, you orange. can actually taste like the, the pith, almost the bitter of the, of the orange in that. Mm. Oh, that's really nice. Mm. Mm. No, I know people who say they didn't like honey until they started trying proper, proper honeys. I believe that. A lot of American honey is based upon a very bland, neutral honey of clover honey. Clover is crap. It's just a sweetener. You should just be using it for cooking or for a substitute for sugar. But if you wish to drizzle something over a cheese or over um, nuts or on ice cream, you're going to want to have a very strong honey, one that can hold its own in the medium it's deployed in. Right. This one is one of those. This is an exceptional honey from Yemen. I got it before the war started. And as American, you should ask, well, which war? But it's the Saudi Yemeni war. I'm, I'm assuming that's the one that's currently wreaking, wreaking, wreaking havoc in Yemen. Yep. And this is from a plant called Sitter. And this is exceptional. It's going to taste like caramelized butter. Now, what is sitter? Sitter is a small white plant that grows in the wadis after the rains. Mm -hmm. And the rains are going to mm -hmm. go sweep across the country. The beekeepers will figure out which way the rains went, and they will go week by week following where the rains were, mm -hmm. trying to catch the blossom of the sitter. It is fantastic. Wow. That's really good. It's also 13% moisture when your average honey is going to be 18. So it's a bit hygroscopic, right. meaning it'll take all the moisture out of your mouth, but it tastes like candy. Right, I can actually feel that happening. But actually, I said, that makes my teeth feel cleaner, so it's okay, it's a nice feeling. <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's actually any real effect. You know. Now that you've tried it, I should let you know that this is about $600 a bottle. I'm worth it. And <laughs> I have tried to get more of that. I have gone to Dubai to, in the UAE to get more sitter. <clears throat> I had a friend meet me. We went wadi bashing up into the mountains. And we met an old beekeeper up there who was just crazy. But he had sitter, but it wasn't anywhere near as good. Something was different about the terrain or the vegetation around. It wasn't as pure. And I've tried to get sitter in Oman, and it was nowhere near as good as that as well. It's very good. So I am, I am sad. Uh, let's go over to Ireland, and let's go talk about the honey of the heathens. Out on the heath. Oh, literally the heathens. The heathens. <laughs> this is a profound, interesting flavor. This particular honey has a glucose and fructose sugar balance that gives it a very unique property it does not crystallize really thick Ever. so tropic wow thick so tropic which is a great word but that is that is what they would have been eating so thick so tropic literally means uh there's an x in there so it's it's a technical word yes but i don't know what it literally means ah, it's just okay. thick so tropic means it does not it doesn't it, it'll it'll coagulate but it doesn't crystallize and so that's probably hasn't changed any in the last thousand years that was the same heather that was out in the the moors wow so that was what they were tasting this one is we're flipping over now into canada and alaska this is the best honey up in the north this is a pioneering plant that comes in after fires Hence, it is called mm. fireweed. It has a dual flavor profile. You're going to taste wow. an initial upfront wang, a good flavor. Meads are made out of this. It's good stuff. Oh, you're going to get the candy in the back. That, the crystals are very, very crunchy and really tasty. Mm. That is very good. That is very rich. And the aftertaste is good. Now, let's go do something weird. This is one of the latest ones I have put into my selection. I have over 200 honey flavors that I have collected in my travels through 55 some odd countries. This is the top 15. And this one I got introduced back in March. It is, you're not going to believe me. I'll just say one word, schmores. Okay. And 
those who don't know what s'mores are, a traditional American campfire dessert <clears throat> is two graham crackers, some chocolate, and then you go put a marshmallow into a fire, not to get it to burn, but to get it to brown, <laughs> absorb heat. The heat of that marshmallow is laid down on top of the chocolate, on top of the crackers, and the heat, the thermal transfer from the marshmallow melts the chocolate to the graham crackers. This tastes like marshmallow. It does actually taste exactly like marshmallow. And I was so surprised, I asked the beekeeper who gave me this, I said, why? He says it's, it's from uh, uh, meadow foam, oh, which is of the mallow family. Yeah, it's a mallow. Mallow, marshmallow. So, so most, most modern marshmallows are not made with mallow of any kind anymore, but when I make marshmallow with honey, actually, I always use actual marshmallow root in it. <clears throat> Good to know. That's funny. So we have two choices. We can either go with a honey mentioned by Pliny the Elder or the wildest honey I've ever produced. Well, let's go with Pliny. Pliny. So Pliny the Elder had a bad disposition for investigating volcanic activity. He died doing it. Pompeii, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Actually, it wasn't in Pompeii, but he was... He was in the Bay of Naples. Yep. He was on his way to try to rescue people, and it didn't go so well. So he mentions two types of honey. The first one is a dangerous honey. Do not eat this, which we now know to be rhododendron, which actually has a good use. You can use it to feed your bees to get them through a, 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 a drought, or if you happen to have an invading army coming at you, you put it on wagons and you let them overrun it. While they feast on it, they're gonna get dizzy, they're gonna get stoned and gonna get inebriated, and they sweep down and they'll go kill them. There's been several recorded battles where that has occurred. They used honey to their advantage to knock out an army's readiness to fight. Okay. This is not that. Good reason. This is the second one. This one is the best honey <clears throat> of Rome, the best you could buy. I heard about it, so I flew to Crete, and I went throughout the island looking for this magical honey, testing many, and finally found what he is talking about. This is phenomenal. This is mm. mountain thyme, Cretan mountain thyme. I don't know if it's a separate... Uh, Species of the <clears throat> genus, but it is different than other mountain times I have tried. It is phenomenal. It's very good. Now, this one is going to be a weird one. Don't know what the plant is, but it showed up in central Texas in a weird time of October. The first two weeks, there's a honey flow. We don't know what it is. It's probably a landscaping plant of some kind. <laughs> Wow. You should taste some nice. berry and then cheesecake. It's very pungent. You should taste a little blueberry and a little cheesecake. Who's getting the cheesecake-y? Back, back your tongue. I will admit I'm completely congested, so I'm not going to taste any of the things <laughs> you think I'm going to taste. But uh, that, it was good. Mm -hmm. She tasted the, the cheesecake. Okay. We don't know what that is. That's just great. <clears throat> now let's move on to Germany. This is a typical honey that the peasants, anybody else could get in the forested areas of Germany. You should smell and taste Christmas trees. This is mm. evergreen. It just, it, it just infuses in all the honey. Mm. Oh, yes. And you can taste that one. Yes, definitely. Mm, it's very good. I could eat a jar of that. Probably. So that probably hasn't changed in a thousand years. This is what they would have been eating. What the peasants would have had a hive or two in the backyard, and this is be what they'd be getting. Right. So there's no change there. That's, now, what would you put bad. that on? You could put that on a probably on a cheese. Yeah, I mean, you could put it on cheese. I'd put that on a toast. Gingerbread. Gingerbread. If you made gingerbread out of this, so so remember everyone, medieval gingerbread is not what you think of as gingerbread. Medieval gingerbread is breadcrumbs pepper, black pepper, ginger, and honey made into basically a paste that you can kind of mold into something else. So it's very pungent, it's very tasty, and that would be amazing as gingerbread. Really would. Oh. That would be amazing as gingerbread. That's also really good on homemade vanilla ice cream. Mm. 
I mean, there's not much that isn't good on homemade vanilla ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, short yeah, list there's, of sweet things. There's, there's some things that don't work as well um, that really overwhelm the ice cream. This one has got a good story. I was in Croatia, which we talk about Middle, Middle Ages. I have never been in a country where people are still so bitter and salty about the Venetian Empire. Oh yeah, no, they, they've never let that they, go. They have, they have let that stick in their craw and they still talk about it. And this is, you know, this is 2023. Well, they still have communities of Italian speakers there that still maintain kind of separate lives, so, you know. So I was in Croatia and I was trying to find beekeepers and I couldn't. So oh, wow. my wife and I went out to a restaurant, had a nice meal. I noticed the restaurant had a lot of Roman artifacts in the walls. And I asked the manager about it and started talking to him. He said, well, when we were building the restaurant, we started digging up into a Roman site. And these are just artifacts we found while we're putting in our foundation. And I just kept them and I put them out for display. And then it turned out he was a beekeeper. <laughs> and he, we got to talking and he took out from the very back, since he owned the restaurant, he had a bottle of his reserve. As a beekeeper, your reserve is your best, your best. My, my strawberry, my raspberry cheesecake, that's a reserve. Mm. We don't sell that, that's ours. And we don't give that away, we don't, we, it's just, it's ours. He had his reserve, and this is his reserve. It is a honey with no vowels. That's, that's a spin around, that's the label, it's Croatian. Right. It's Hervert. Right. It's H-R-V-T, Hervert. Croatia's in strange language. <laughs> So that would that's, It's go. very good because it's, it actually, I like it because it's not very sweet, <laughs> which is going to be a strange thing to say, but it's, um, it's slightly astringent. It's, it's slightly bitter. Um, yeah. It also crystallizes in three days. I can imagine. So I have to put it out in the sun to get it, keep it warm while I'm here at Pinsic. Now the next two, we're getting into the best of Italy. This hasn't changed in hundreds of years. But it's polarizing. It's polarizing? <laughs> it's polarizing. You love it or you hate it. There's nothing in between. Smell that. If it smells like medicine, you're done. No, it smells like Manuka honey, actually, to me. But my nose, I mean, I'm, complete, I'm congested from all the fire smoke that I've been doing. Okay, this, this is going to give you a kick. So, smell this. It is chestnut. I and would not have guessed that. It polarizes, so you either love it or hate it. When I first bought the bottle, because I heard it was good stuff, I thought I had a bad bottle because it was awful. And then I bought another bottle, different place, and it was just as awful. <laughs> but we found out after a few years of doing honey tastings that people who like dark, bitter beers love the darker honeys. And that chestnut will sometimes win in a group mm. of dark beer drinkers. So whatever your palate tells you is correct. If you're not a dark beer fan, you don't like this honey, you don't like this honey. Nothing wrong with you, it's just your palate. No, I like more florals, some people like more dark. I love that, that would be amazing on Buckley Pancakes. Freak. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is weird. And that one's the most polarizing of all the honey. So let's now move on to something more strange. More strange. And it's, it's, it's black like motor oil. Mm -hmm. And this is from Zambia. And Zambia does have a strong honey tradition. I believe they were trading back in the 1600s, 1700s. And the things they can trade are things that are portable and expensive and small, which is honey. That is Zambezi River Basin, jungle honey. And it has such a great property that when I am doing charcuterie and I am curing meats, I'm smoking them for six or seven hours on a applewood fire. I will glaze it with this honey to mm. finish it off. It's also fantastic on ice cream. That is a very interesting flavor. Think of it as molasses. Mm. It's not, not my favorite for certain. So, so far we've covered three, three, 12 honeys. Which one does your palate like the best? You know, it's, it's, it's... Your, your it, pal's a little off right now because yeah, you're, you're congested. Yeah, because I'm completely congested. I, yeah, really liked... 
probably the one that tasted like, uh, like well, like you said, pecan pie. The, Granger Ranger yeah. Extreme Hunt. But 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 the bitter one. Orange. No, the orange one was very good too. Actually, the one that I said was bitter and astringent, which I guess was maybe the the Croatian. Hervet. Yeah. Hervet. Yeah, the Hervet was very good. Gesundheit. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and the 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 uh, the dark forest honey was also very good. Maybe the dark forest honey might be my favorite, actually. And if you test yourself in the morning versus the evening, your palate will also shift. Ah. So what time of day you're at, how tired you are, how what you ate last will affect your palate as well. But generally, you'll focus pretty close in the same range. The competition we've had for the last four days is the winners have been the Pliny the Elder, his, his uh, Cretan honey, that one, the uh, meadow foam one, much much to my chagrin. <laughs> All of the marshmallow and lovers out there. Sitter nailed it one day. The the, the yemeni. Sitter, the sitter was also very good. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. And it's uh, very good. And then we've had close run-ups with uh, fireweed. Right. Uh, today we had a tie between the fireweed and sitter. Right. So those are all ex extremely good, and you can get commercially several of these wahia you can buy fireweed you can buy and uh, you can buy chestnut in some stores uh, but yes these are some of these are exotics and then some of these are common right but it's really up to where you are to what you can get your hands on well if, i mean i thought they were all good i i don't think there's anyone i wouldn't eat each has a purpose. Even yeah. even clover has a purpose. Well, yeah, as you, if you said, if it's you run out of sugar, honey. you can use it's clover. A good cooking honey. Now, what we do with honeys we don't like, there is a, a hidden dark secret that that goes into barbecue sauces. Oh well, I would. I wish more barbecue sauces had honey instead of high fructose corn syrup. That would be great. Horseradish will hide all sins. <laughs> um, our local beekeeping club has a competition, a, a honey tasting every August. And everyone's allowed three ticks. So there's a sheet of paper by all these honeys, 100 honeys out. And you use a toothpick and taste each one. And you're allowed to put a tick by the ones you like. And if you want to put two ticks by the your, one that you're like amazed by, you can do that. I, at the end of that tasting, want to go to the ones that have no ticks by them. Because <laughs> it's the weirdest, awfulest stuff that you, you'll never find again. And there are some just interesting flavors out there that will make your eye twitch but it's good to get an idea of what's available what's possible i would never have believed there would be a, a mellow uh, marshmallow honey if i hadn't have tried it so that's it i think i'm, I'm gonna wind it up there yep. unless you want to go in some more i can uh no i just actually have a question so when did we start keeping bees as a species rather than just climbing up trees Ooh. and risking our lives all right, well, honey. we know from drawings there's honey hunters back in 7000 BCE mm -hmm. that was found in Spain, but that was a honey hunter. Right, yeah. Uh, we some, know, some crazy person climbing into a cave or a tree. I know there's 2,000 years ago there was a apiary found, well, a 2,000 year old apiary was found in Israel in the last 20 years that was excavated. Uh, and I also know that there was honey kept by the Egyptians. And of course, there's the honey found in the tombs in Egypt that mm -hmm. was yeah. uh, 2,500 years old or more. No, 3,000 years old or more. In the last 20 years in Georgia, the country, they recently found a 4,500 year old jar of honey. So we don't know if that was wild harvested, wild or, or mm -hmm. cultivated, mm -hmm. but you know, people are lazy. <clears throat> <laughs> that hasn't changed. So as soon as they figured out how to keep them, they would. I know the Greeks began even using movable frame hives, which was a woven basket with top bars on it mm. as far back as 2,500 years ago. Oh, interesting. So beyond that, I'd have to go do a lot of research, and then you're going to have to argue with half a dozen beekeepers as to whether or not that really means they kept it, right. or whether it was, if it was simply it occupied that volume and they just kept going back and harvesting it. Right. The Ukrainians, <clears throat> I think going back hundreds to thousands of years, began keeping bees in the trees and they cut a section out to get into the tree. 
and they'd put it back in place after they pulled it out. It's a good idea. And they start putting in carvings as to which family owns this wild tree in the woods. Right. So you'd carve in your family's emblem or your name or what have you, and you just respect that and don't go invading their tree. Right. So <clears throat> the answer is I don't know. Oh, right. Well, it's, it's an interesting answer anyway to know that we have visuals of people hunting, hunting honey, which is a very <laughs> dangerous and a desperate sort of sport, but it also shows how people didn't always have access to, you know, things with concentrated amounts of sugars in them. Well, I really appreciate this. This was really delicious and a lot of fun, and now I want buckwheat pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> I have buckwheat with me. I, I wish we had the capability here, but unfortunately we do not have our household cook, nor the kitchen. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. This has been super interesting. And I guess you're off to go dance now? I, I am off to go do another honey tasting. Another honey tasting. Well, thank you very much and have a lovely day. And uh, I hope we can catch up later. Very much thank you for having me on and I will see you later. Okay. Okay, bye everyone. I hope you liked watching me taste honey. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I can't uh, reach the shore, but... Oh, that's hot. It does, it gets very hot. Sorry, everyone, it's about to get very dizzy. You have to just lift it off. Oh. Yeah. That there screen, you should have disconnected okay. the live feed. No, 